Welcome back to Men and the City. In today's video, we're gonna talk about a world on fire, acceleration and escalation. A couple months ago, I made a video indicating that I thought there would be a series of fall surprises this year. And I believe that that process has begun. There are various tremors around the world that appear to be giving and that suggests that the world is undergoing tremendous uncertainty, volatility, and instability. So what does that mean? How are these forces congealing, dissipating? Ultimately, what will be the result of this escalation and acceleration? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before I get started, I want to quote an Englishman who I think said something very relevant for all of us that are trying to think through world events or even socio-political events or national events. Because countries, movements, leaders, whatever, are complex, they're dynamic, they're convoluted. And so to try and parameterize them or try to make some kind of worldview fit over top of all of these forces is often a hazardous affair. So before I get started, I, I want us to bear in mind what Walter Badgett said. He said, in order to illustrate a principle, you must exaggerate much and you must omit much. So indulge me as I go through this, because I'm going to do a little bit of both in order for us to better understand what's happening in the world today. Because I don't think a lot of folks, especially in the Western world, really understand exactly what is happening. And that is, in effect that we are leaving an old order, that, that we are experiencing the emergence of a new world order. But that new world order is not one that has been planned. It's not one that has been manufactured or fabricated, which is a fairly constant theme that I see expressed on YouTube and beyond. I started my career in the Navy in 2007. And when I came into the service, the US uh, defense budget was soaring. It was very much as it is today. Uh, this unending spike in one direction, higher and higher and higher. And we were actually encouraged when I was in the service to respond to those incentives, meaning every year's budget should be bigger than last year's budget. And we would submit requests for equipment or new uh, new health benefits or whatever accordingly. Well, that all changed in 2008. It changed like a heart attack. It completely stopped. And it stopped because we had a global financial crisis. And as many of you know, that was centered in the United States housing market at the time. But when that began to unravel, the entire posture of the command that I was in changed immediately instead of spending more and more and more every year, we immediately began to cannibalize equipment. We asked other ships uh, for old equipment that they no longer needed. We were short staffed all the time. In other words, we went from seemingly endless abundance to acute scarcity just like that. And part of the reason is because we had no plan. There was no forward thinking or an assumption that resources would become scarce whatsoever. Fast forward to 2010, I was working on Capitol Hill at the time, and this was right on the heels of the election of Barack Obama. And when that happened, there was a revolt. There was a, a new mass movement that had begun called the Tea Party. The Tea Party was completely spontaneous. It was almost unprovoked, at least in, in the thinking of people in Washington, D.C. And you have to remember that if you work on Capitol Hill, people are allowed to walk into the offices. And so the Tea Party, which is motivated primarily by a disgust and a, a sense of urgency about U.S. government spending and the bailouts of Wall Street in the aftermath of 2008, these people were very angry, and hundreds of thousands of them descended upon Washington, D.C. In, in droves to vent their frustration with Washington, D.C. Uh, there used to be a lot of YouTube videos that showed the extent of these protests. Many of them have been taken down. 
But the Tea Party movement and you might say its leftist equivalent, Occupy Wall Street, they sprung to life seemingly out of nowhere because of a collective sense of frustration and corruption from the political structure. Again, this was unexpected. Fast forward to 2016. I was in, in D.C. at the time, and I remember vividly having discussions with various folks about the prospects of Donald Trump becoming president. Now, I'm not going to say that I knew immediately that he would be elected president. I didn't. But I did figure out probably by that summer, the summer of, uh, of 2016, that he was going to win election. Nobody in Washington, D.C. thought that, that was even remotely possible. And when he was elected, it sent shockwaves through the entire D.C. community. People were extremely upset, and it was obvious that they had not planned for this eventuality. That all leads me to the present moment. Now, obviously, a lot of things have changed over the last few years, uh, beginning most profoundly with COVID. But what's beginning to happen now, and the subject of this video, is that there is an acceleration of many of these transformative influences happening as we speak. And they are beginning to lead to serious instability. So let's start with the macroeconomic picture. Governments around the world are beginning to experience higher interest rates. The cost of debt is skyrocketing everywhere. Now, this is most uh, infamously, I, I suppose, the case with the United States and its reckless spending that dates back decades and decades. But the reality is that governments around the world are beginning to experience what I call debt capacity. And that is basically the, the case uh, in the, the major Western countries. It's the case in the United Kingdom. It's the case in Italy. It's the case in Germany. And of course, it's the case in the United States. And some of, some of these moves in interest rates or yields, as they call them in the bond market, are alarming. They're not incremental movements. They're exponential movements that are beginning to, in my judgment, achieve escape velocity, meaning they're normalizing to historic norms. And that simply is untenable for governments around the world. That's one problem. Another problem is that the world is increasingly experiencing resource scarcity. And specifically, I want to talk about oil as an exemplar of that. The global demand for oil today, ladies and gentlemen, is fast outpacing the supply. A lot of this is simply because in the United States and other Western countries, we have attempted very foolishly, very erroneously to divest away from fossil fuels. And what that, what that means specifically is that huge amounts of money from Wall Street has been flooded or redirected away from legacy fossil fuel businesses and infrastructure and downstream companies and into alternative energy or green tech. And, and let's be frank, that isn't working. A lot of this green tech has been exaggerated. It's not uh, even meaningfully impacting this global supply mis- uh, mispricing or this disequilibrium around the world, not just in oil, but in natural gas and other key commodities that we need, in some cases that we need uh, to support or provide the inputs for the very alternative energy that Wall Street and the U.S. government and Western governments say that they want. This demonstrates, again, a lack of planning, a lack of strategic thinking, a lack of of understanding of how economies and particularly in industry functions around the world. So there's that problem. In addition to that, we have various supply chain issues that started with this war in Ukraine. So it might surprise you to know that in 2021, this, the Suez Canal was basically shut down. It was like a highway locked down on 95 or on the 5 if you live out in California or if you live in New York City. It was a traffic jam. And the reason for that was because the, the demand for liquefied natural gas, much of which has to be shipped, um, 
locked down the world, right? It saturated the entire global economy and it spiked natural gas prices. The world is experiencing acute shortages in everything now, in everything, largely because demand from Asia has structurally accelerated. And there are no easy answers to solving that problem, short of building new refineries, new industrial capacity, and flooding fossil fuel companies such that they feel comfortable drilling again. And even if those steps were taken, it would take years and years to address the backlog. Acceleration. In addition to those problems, we have geopolitical acceleration. So some of you are probably following what's, what's been happening in the Middle East over the last few hours. And specifically, there was, uh, again, um, the unthinkable happened in Israel. And that is to say that Hamas launched this attack, which actually penetrated into Israeli borders. And now they, they damaged Israeli military equipment. They've got hostages, so forth and so on. And it appears as though Hamas and potentially Hezbollah and Turks and Persians and other various groups that are hostile to the Israelis may be cooperating on some level. Now that's unconfirmed, we don't know that. But what this suggests to me is a tectonic plate that's shifting in the Middle East, a new balance of power, right? A reorganization of that region is underway. The same thing happened and surprised Western elites in Ukraine. Remember in the lead up to Ukraine, the assumption was that the Russians would never go in because they were afraid of Western sanctions. Then when they did go in, the assumption was that sanctions would destroy their economy. That didn't happen. Then the next assumption was that a global coalition would ally with the West against Putin. He would be isolated and ultimately his government would fall. That's not what happened. Instead, most of the world, specifically the BRICS, but not just the BRICS, not just Brazil and India and China and South Africa and so forth, not just those countries, but the Gulf Coast countries, countries in Latin America and Africa, the world over, sided, at least it appears, with the Russians. And in part, they did this because they're tired of the US dollar, they're tired of DC and Western elites determining their fate for them in what has been called the Washington Consensus. Again, tectonic plates are shifting. And even inside the West, there is a fracturing of this NATO or European Union alliance. New parties like AFD in Germany, um, a recently new president in Slovakia, a guy named Robert Fico was just elected and he does not support escalation in Ukraine. There's even evidence that the, the Polish support, and remember that Poland has been a stalwart of support of this war against Russia, there's even evidence that support there is breaking down. At the same time, Western elites are doubling down. They are escalating and bringing more forces to bear into this fight, specifically the United Kingdom, uh, which is shipping missiles and, and potentially new forces that are sensibly going to Ukraine to train their forces to fight the Russians. But uh, that is just a pretext likely for further military escalation of the United Kingdom and, and presumably of the United States. That speaks to escalation. What does all of this mean? Well, um, to compound all of these problems, you have internal domestic issues that are arising. So some of you, I'm sure, are aware that the Speaker of the House was removed in a lightning coup launched by some Republicans inside the House of Representatives who were tired of the Uniparty, led by uh, Kevin McCarthy, who was, until about a week ago or a few days ago, the Speaker of the House. What does this mean? Well, this is the breakdown of the Uniparty in America, and it's emblematic of a breakdown of globalist control over Western governments across the West. This is a big deal. You're going to see more governments 
start to implode internally in the West. Not just because there is a fracturing of support for the war in Ukraine, or because of energy prices, or because of compound fracturing around the world, but simply because governments in the West are negligent. They're incompetent. They haven't accounted for these changes at all. Instead, they've doubled down. How have they doubled down? They've doubled down in terms of censorship. So some of you may be aware that a law was passed in the United Kingdom, and it looks like there's going to be similar censorship laws like this passed by the European Union. But there was something called the Trusted News Initiative, or the Trusted Network Initiative. And this is a consortium of big tech companies and mainstream media to attack, undermine, or suppress alternative media or any news that's deemed fake. Well, this Orwellian tactic has already uh, come with collateral damage. So Russell Brand was recently uh, the target of, of this effort, in my view, because he and others like him have been raising questions about the vaccine. They've been raising questions about the war in Ukraine. They have been fanning the flames of dissident voices against the legacy mainstream media and legacy governments in the West. This is only going to intensify. What does this mean for the neo-masculine movement? What does this mean for masculinity? What does this mean for this transitional period that we're in as we speak? It means that our time is coming. It means that the whole world is changing and that the rate of change is beginning to accelerate, which is why you're seeing an escalation. It's why you're seeing the legacy structure double down on old tactics, whether it's censorship or talking points or mainstream media newspeak. That's all they've got. They don't really understand the extent to which these changes are unraveling their power base. And that's only going to continue. So that's a lot to digest. It's a lot to think about. But this is a theme that is only going to pick up between now and the end of the year. The world is on fire, but the good news is that the world on the other side of this is going to be a very different world, and it's going to demand new leaders, new mass movements, and that will be the time for the neo-masculine movement, which will be an umbrella that coordinates and consolidates a lot of these dissident voices and forces moving against a structure that's falling apart the gerontocracy, the beta tyrants as I call them. Stay tuned for more and we'll talk soon.